In this video, we want to look at the Chopin Prelude in A-flat major, Opus 28, number 17. So I ask you to listen to this and to um, uh, at least identify the return of the opening um, and then try to uh, analyze the song form structure. So if you will please open up a score to that from the website. Then we're going to um, listen to a recording of this and to talk through the analysis. So like the um, Mendelssohn spinning song, this example starts with a simple introduction uh, that is two measures long and it's just a repeated A flat major harmony. It's a six four inversion, um, but the the main theme, the opening theme, is presented in the third measure. And please note that it begins on a five seven harmony, and then cadences to tonic on the second measure of part one. So that would be the downbeat of measure four, and. So this is um, a polyphonic texture. You hear the melody in the top voice. Um, it's very lyrical. And you're going to hear this in four measure phrases. Although you have a two measure semi-phrase that is a motivic idea that Chopin uses to generate uh, all of the material in this opening part, this opening theme. So we are going to listen to this part one. I might point out that at the end of the uh, second phrase that you have a half cadence, so that is the um, last measure of the second system and that so it's a cadence on a five chord on the e flat major and then you have um, another parallel phrase so this opening part one is going to be a, a parallel double period and then the end of the uh, fourth phrase there on that uh, second page, second line, third measure is an authentic cadence on A flat major on tonic. And so the overall form is a parallel double period uh, for this part one. And so you're going to listen for the way that that comes back uh, at part three and then when it comes back as part five. And as I mentioned earlier, you want to always compare the way that uh, returning material is treated and make a, make a statement about that. So what happens then straight away on that second page, second system, fourth measure, where you have a G sharp in the melody and an E natural, is that we have at that point an inharmonic modulation and um, it just shifts to A major. So that, that first measure is an E7 going to A major at the end of that line, the second line, second page. All right, but let's listen to the, the presentation of the um, opening part and We'll stop it when we get right there at the inharmonic uh, modulation where we begin part two. Okay, 
so right there, cadence on A flat major. That's the end of part one. So you have a two measure simple introduction, and then you had 16 measures for part one, which then was a parallel double period. And so, like I said, at that point where you have the G sharp, that is an inharmonic spelling of the A flat that was the last melody note from the, the end of part one. And that becomes then the third of an E7 harmony. And that then leads to then uh, touching on A major on the downbeat of the last measure of that line. And then it's going to present that same semi-phrase. It's going to sequence that. And it's going to then have a G-sharp 7 harmony in that first measure of the third system. And then that touches on C-sharp minor. So that ends the first phrase of part 2. And then this is going to... Um, to touch on E major for a moment, and you're going to hear uh, you know, some repetition in the middle of this uh, phrase that is going to uh, lead to a cadence on E major that occurs there in the third measure of the fourth system of the second page. So, um, what we had was uh, a four measure phrase, and then we had another phrase that was extended by an extra measure. Um, and that was with repetition, so it was the third measure of the second phrase, which is that you know, first measure of the, of the uh, fourth system. Um, and it cases on E major. All right, so once the cadence is on E major, then you're, here, you're hearing that you're in that key. The final measure of that line, then, you're going to hear that minor four chord. And I, I mentioned that um, previously about uh, that borrowed chord being something with this particular prelude that Chopin uses um, at several points in the prelude. So that will be the first time that you hear it. And so I would make the case that uh, when you hear that uh, minor four, then that is the point uh, where the retransition begins. And that is going to connect you to the first return of the opening material. So in other words, it's going to connect you to part three that occurs at the fortissimo there on that second page. Uh, and that occurs there on the bottom uh, line, the bottom system of the second page. Uh, so it's the second measure there where it's marked in you know, a fortissimo. So um, again, this is an enharmonic modulation back to the opening key of A flat major. And so it goes from that um, E major. Um, and what is going to happen is uh, we're, we're going to hear in the fourth measure of the second to last system of that page. In the middle of the measure, you see you have a, a G sharp, um, B, D sharp harmony. So it's G sharp minor. Then in the last measure, he enharmonically spells that as A flat minor. That A flat minor then uh, is then making its way back to the flat key of, of A flat major. And you've got a 7, 7, a 5, and then it returns to a 5 chord, which as I mentioned, the Part one began with a five seven chord, so that's how it's always going to begin is on the dominant harmony. So that happens right there at the fortissimo. So anyway, it'll be easier to kind of uh, follow the, along with this as I uh, kind of pointed out as, as we listen to it.
All right, so here we are at that beginning of the part two. So we just cadenced on A flat, and now it's going to shift to an uh, E7 harmony, and then to A major, and then it's going to sequence and so forth. is going to have another inharmonic modulation. And so um, what we're going to see at this point, then, let me get to that on my score. So this is the very end of the top system of uh, the top of the page, of page 512. And you see that the, the second to last uh, measure was the cadence uh, chord of the, of the end of the second phrase. And so that's an E flat uh, major triad, so it's a five chord. So you, you see the bass that you have an E flat, well then in the next downbeat you have a D sharp, so that's the enharmonic spelling of the E flat. And again, that becomes the third of a 5-7 harmony of a major minor 7 chord. So that's a B7 um, chord. And that then um, is going to shift to the key of E major on the next line, the downbeat of that second system. And um, then it stays in E major. So that first phrase is in E major. And then you're going to sequence that. And it is going to sequence up by step to F sharp major. So the next four measures are in F sharp major. So it starts out with a, a C sharp seven and then F sharp major. And then the third phrase here um, is going to sequence um, this, that falling third idea and so you have another four measures there that is the uh, third phrase. And then you have a final phrase that is only three measures in length. So that's an irregular length. And it is a cadence on E flat major. So that is how part four uh, concludes, is, is uh, you know, landing on that dominant harmony of E flat major. And then what follows that is an A flat minor harmony. So there is that minor four chord again. And so I would make the case there that that is where the retransition to part 
five would occur. And so you've got it a couple times there, uh, E flat major to A flat minor, E flat major, A flat minor of the end of the line. And then that last line of that page is just resounding that E flat major five chord, just like the beginning. So that brings back that auxiliary idea there. So again, that's just a general concept is that auxiliary members could share uh, material. And that is something that can kind of give you a sense of logic in, in uh, pointing, you know, identifying where those, those passages begin. Because a lot of times that's a difficult place to just put your finger exactly on where something begins. And we're going to hear that at the end of this prelude. It's hard to put your finger exactly on where, you know, the codetta begins. But for sure you can say, you know, that the latest place that it would begin is, you know, we're going to point that out. Um, but you've got definitely some extension at the end of that fourth phrase of the re final return of the, uh, the main theme. All right, so let's go back now and just listen to part four. So we just heard a half cadence, um, and that was on E flat major. That melody has a B flat, and there's an E flat in the bass, so we're on that fourth measure of the top of page 512. And then what we're going to hear is that B flat is going to go up a half step to B natural. And the inharmonic spelling of E flat in the left hand is going to be spelled as D sharp and it's going to be then cast within that har harmony of, of, of a B major minor seventh chord. All right, let's pick it up right there. For sure, it has that sense of nostalgia about it. Presented. I mean, it's kind of unusual the the uh, performance direction there because he marks sotto voce, so that's a whisper. It's pianissimo, but you have a sforzando there in the bass, and so I mean, you'll hear some pianists play it really loud. Now, this is uh, uh, Gregory Sokolov, the great Russian virtuoso, great artist. And um, he keeps it within the context of sotto voce, so you don't really hear that much on it. But it is a, a tonic um, pedal tone that you hear underneath that whole final presentation of the theme. Um, so he brings the whole thing back, and then at the end of the fourth phrase, then you're going to hear that minor four chord again. 